As you can see, uh, I am uh, I am much shorter than Rabbi Burnham. So that is, <laughs> Rabbi Burnham is not here. Uh, he'll be back next week. And uh, so I, I'm teaching today. My name is Rabbi Noam Gross. And so first of all, I just want to wish a big thank a big thank you to uh, again Partners Detroit once again for hosting this wonderful class, and and for all of you coming out on this very very cold day. Um, it was so cold, I almost didn't feel like coming. <laughs> we <Windshield> shall won. <laughs> and if the rabbi almost doesn't feel like coming, then you guys are all still here. So that's, you know, so a big, uh, a big round of applause to all of you for coming out today. And uh, this class uh, should be also merit for the uh, speedy recovery of Moshe Berkman. That's Moshe Binyamin Halevi Ben Shana Gittel, that he should have a, a speedy recovery. Okay, so uh, today's source sheet is the Holy Babu, right here. We're going to take a little little cruise through through the Torah in today's class. Uh, as you know, these the uh, the past few parshas have uh, have mo mostly been dealing with Yosef and his brothers, Joseph and his brothers, um, and it's it's an incredible thing when you think about it, right? The the, the amount of ink that the Torah devotes to a story. You know, is one indication, a major indication of, of you know how vital the lessons are for future generations, and so, the story which is spoken about the most obviously is is the Exodus. You know, everything that happened there with Moshe and and the and the miracles and and leaving Egypt and the giving of the Torah, which is the foundation of of the Torah life that we live now. So that that obviously has the most written about it. But when you go back to the the book of Genesis, the book of Bereshis. Uh, you know, you go through it. So what do you have? You have, you know, a little bit about the beginning of time with, uh, with Adam and, and then Noah and, and the flood, okay? Then you get to the forefathers where the, the Torah highlights, you know, very, uh, very important events in their life. And it goes from one forefather to the next. And then you get to Yosef and his brothers where we're basically, for the most part, dealing with them for three, four weeks in a, in a row, three, four parshas. And that clearly there's, there's a lot going on there. And it's interesting because what happened until then was you had, you know, the forefathers who were all great individuals and who were, you know, the, the foundation of the nation. And then you have the 12 sons of Yaakov. And they're really the first ones to represent the beginning of the actual Jewish people. They're the first time that we have an actual distinct group. And so we'll, we'll see that the... You know the the, the journey that they that they go through is really a microcosm of of the journey of the Jewish people and us individually. You know that that's really where we see um, that happening, and we go into great detail. Right, it reads like a like a gripping novel. Right, you go through the story. It's, you're, just, you're sitting on the edge of your seat, trying to see what you know what's going to happen next, unless you remember from last year. <laughs> But uh, but that's what we have. So so let's let us let us and so it begins. You know, let, let let's look at exactly at exactly what happens with them. So first you have to get a bit of perspective on the story. So again, we, you know, we know that that Yaakov favors his son Yosef. He you know gives him extra time, special treatment, gives him the special cloak, and the brothers are jealous. And then it doesn't get any better. Yosef starts telling them these dreams that they're bowing down to him. Everyone's bowing down to him. Doesn't make things any easier. And, and then what happens? And then something very interesting happens. Uh, Yaakov tells Yosef to go check on his brothers. And so he tells him, he says, right, your brothers are pasturing in Shechem. You know, I will send you to them. He says, okay, I'll go. And he says, okay, go see how they're doing. And, 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 you know, and he sends him with things. And so the verse says, he sent him from the, from the, the valley of Hebron, the depth of Hebron, and he arrived at Shechem. And so the, 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 the Torah, the Talmud and the Medrash uh, rightfully ask, they say, wait, that makes no sense. Hebron is not in a valley. So what does it mean 
that he sent him from the valley of, of Hebron. So, so the, the, the Medrash explains that this verse is hinting to something. It says, it doesn't mean literally the, 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 the valley or the depth of Hebron. It means the depth, you know, the, the deeper idea of the one who was buried in Hebron. And who was, who was buried in Hebron? Avram. Avram, that's right. Abraham and Sarah. And this is a reference to the, the covenant that God originally made with Avram, with Abraham. And in that covenant, God shows Abraham, you know, a, a panoramic view, of some sort of prophetic vision of what's going to happen in the future to his descendants. And there's this whole plan, and, and like he tells them, they're, they're going to go down to Egypt and be slaves in Egypt, and then they'll come out. And so this is a reference right here. He says, so he sent him from the depth of Hebron. Meaning to say, Yaakov, as far as Yaakov knows, he's sending his son Yosef to check on his brothers. But the Torah is telling us that there's a lot more going on. As far as God's concerned, this is now the beginning of a very long chain of events that are meant to happen. <clears throat> and so, while Yosef and, and everyone else thinks that he's going to just go check on his brothers and come home, no. Things are going to take a very drastic turn. There's a bigger picture. And that is, that is kind of like the prelude to everything that's going to happen here. There's, there's no question that God it, it has a very ready hand. He is very involved in major events in history. You know, when, 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 things, when the world events have to unfold in a certain way, He takes a very active role in making sure that those things happen. And therefore, there, you'll see throughout this story, and even other times in history, you'll see throughout this story that very smart, very wise men their judgment seems to be a little clouded throughout the story. And, and that is to make sure that, that the, uh, the events unfold the way that they are meant to. And so Yaakov, you know, our great forefather, uh, who is on a level unimaginable, is favoring his son Yosef in front, of his, in front of his kids. Looks a little funny. His brothers, what do they say? They say, oh, clearly Yosef is, is, is dangerous. And, uh, and so they, they, they're just, they go right ahead with moving him on. Yosef, on his part, right, he's, he's just telling dreams, which, you know, you could only assume he knew would infuriate everybody. But he's just, he, he goes once, twice. There's a lot of funny things happening here. And th this verse is, is, you know, wakes us up and reminds us there's a lot more going on here than just you know, personalities. There are personalities here, but behind the scenes we're seeing God is actively intervening to make sure that the vision that He showed Avraham during the covenant is going to happen. He's going to make sure it, it comes out. And it's interesting. You know, where do we see this happen again? So, just a few verses later, what happens? They see him coming. The brothers see him coming. And it says, And when he had not yet approached, they conspired against him to kill him. And they said to one another, Look, that dreamer is coming. So now come and let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits and we will say a wild beast devoured him. That's right. And then it says, Then we shall see what will become of his dreams. Now that's a strange line of sarcasm, you know, to put in the Torah. You know, that's a line that you would expect to find in any novel, but, you know, the Torah is not known for throwing in cute sarcasm, sarcastic lines, you know, then we'll see what will become of his dreams, because he'll be dead, right? Well, that's really, really not necessary. And so Rashi right away comes and says, this makes no sense, you know, what is this line doing here? Of course, when he's dead, you know, he will, we'll see what, there won't be any dreams that will come true, and this just isn't necessary. So he says, what is happening here? This is one of the few moments in the Torah where God literally interjects the story with his own statement. He says, this is God talking. So while the brothers are saying, you know, let's, let's, we'll kill him, we'll throw him into the pit, and a wild beast devours him, God then comes in and interjects and says, by the way, he's not talking to them, he's talking to us. By the way, we shall see what will become of his dreams. Meaning to say, 
you guys have this all figured out. You have this whole plot. Joseph is going to be, you'll get rid of him. End of story. No, no, no. We'll see what will become of his dreams. There's a bigger picture here. And so very clearly, you know, throughout the, 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 the story, you see very clearly that God is, is very involved here. And he's making sure things happen a certain way, like we said, because there's a bigger picture. There are things that have to happen. Like he told our, our forefather Avram, if things are going to happen, he's going to make sure that these things are going to happen. And so these, you know, these, these big mistakes, this, this clouding of judgment, is, is definitely fueling the story. And that is lesson number one. Right there, you have history of the Jewish people right there. You have people, you know, there are many plots. Right? We say it in the Pesach Seder every year, Behisha Amda. There, there are many plots and schemes and ideas surrounding the Jewish people. And to all of them, God always says, we shall see. We'll see what's going to happen. And there are times when I'm going to have to take a very active role in making sure things happen. And it doesn't matter what everyone else's plan is. There's a destiny for the Jewish people, and I'm going to make sure it happens. And I'll give you another example, which is a famous example. The Talmud says that during the destruction of the Second Temple, the, the great elder sage leading the Jewish people at the time, his name was Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. And he was holed up in the, in the city of Jerusalem. There were the, the Romans had a siege going around Jerusalem for a while. He managed to escape. Now, it was, it was a daring plan because the, uh, the terrorists kind of running the show inside the city would not allow anyone to defect to the, Roman, to, the, to the Roman army. And if they caught anyone even thinking of doing that, they killed him on the spot. But he managed to sneak out. It was a whole plan. And he went straight to the Roman camp. They said, we have this, uh, this, this defector from the, Jewish, from, from the city. They brought him to, to Vespasian who was the, the Roman general at the time. And he said to Vespasian, you know, I have a, a, a tradition that... He said to him, oh, uh, you know, praise Emperor Vespasian. So Vespasian said, you know, I should kill you on the spot for, for, for that blasphemy. He says, you know that I'm not the emperor. He says, the emperor is in Rome right now. I'm the general of the army. He said, no. We have a, 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 a Masorah tradition that the temple cannot be destroyed by somebody who is not the leader of the, of the known world. You know, that's part of, even when God <coughs> has to destroy the temple, it'll be done as, in as shameless a way as possible. So as at least the temple is not destroyed by some ragged nation or, or person. No, it's going to be destroyed by the leading people of, of the time, by the leading person. So he says, you're going to be the emperor. Not now, really soon. And then, in the middle of the conversation, uh, he gets the telegram saying that the emperor has died, that he is now the, he is now the new Caesar, and, uh, and he's supposed to come back to Rome. So, he's very impressed by what just happened. You know, it, it seems miraculous. And so what did he say? He said to him, okay, I'm going to grant you three wishes. Three wishes. And so he gives his wishes. One of the wishes was, he says, give me ya Yavne v'chachamea. He says, give me the city of Yavne and all the re re sages that are still alive and let us live in peace there so that we can continue our leadership of the Jewish people from the Talmudic Ac Academy in Yavne. And he said, okay, granted. Which is really, you know, to him seemed like a small request, but that was really the source of, of Jewish leadership for, for, for generations. It came from there. That was integral in terms of, you know, keeping the, the continuity of the Jewish people and their traditions. The Talmud says something very interesting. The Talmud says that Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai actually made a mistake. Because it was a moment of, of incredible favor. And had he asked Vespasian at the time to just spare the city of Jerusalem and the temple, Vespasian would have granted it. But... You know, it references a, ver a verse from the from Proverbs, from Mishlei, which says that, that sometimes God renders the wise foolish. And, and it, this was one of those cases where God specifically, you know, cl clouded his judgment, intervened, to make sure that he would not request that because the temple had to be destroyed. Right? The Jewish people were no longer worthy of the temple. 
they had to go into, in, into the final exile that he had told Abraham about all those, all those centuries ago. And so he made sure that that request was not asked. He did not ask that of, of Vespasian. And instead, he asked for Yavne and his Chachamim, so that way at least the Jewish people could continue. That is, that's another classic example. There are many other examples, but there's many examples where, where God ha has to intervene in a direct way, clouding judgment to make sure that things come about in a certain way. And that's what happens here. And that's the bigger picture. You know, the, the bigger picture here of, of the lesson that we're supposed to learn from here is, is, again, something that we can, like I said, can extrapolate to the Jewish people throughout history. But the players themselves, you know, the Joseph and his brothers, also bring a certain element to the story, which is, again, something that you'll see very much lives on in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's take a look at the bigger picture and what happens. So let, let's, we're going to see two different angles here. We have the brothers and Yosef, right? Two different stories. One story from two different perspectives. But, so let's look at it first from the perspective of the brothers. Right? What do they see? They see Yosef as a threat to the future of the Jewish people. He's clearly, you know, got an in with the father. He's saying all these, all these crazy dreams, radical dreams that he's going to rule. Everyone's going to bow down to him. His father's going to bow down to him. Crazy things. Now, they have reason to be worried. Why do they have reason to be worried? Where have they seen something like this before? Any ideas? Of a uh, crazy brother trying to take over? Oh, Esau. Esau. Yes, Esau. Give me, give me another example. Another Yishmael. Yishmael, right. Right? History repeats itself. They say, you know, there's, there's always a rotten apple. So you look, Avraham had Isaac, Yitzchak, and Yishmael. Yishmael was, was dangerous. Eventually, at the end of his life, he repents. But he had to be driven out of the house. Then you have Yitzchak. Who does he have? He has the twin sons, Yaakov and Esau. Esau, again, very dangerous. So here it's just, it's, it's a... It's another day in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the big family. You know, uh, another generation. Here we go. It's the 11 of us versus the crazy guy, the dangerous guy. And so they say, you know what? We've uh, we got to do something about this. You know, we're, they, they understood that there was a greater Jewish destiny that they were, that they were meant to fulfill. They were supposed to be the, the, uh, the front runners. And we can't let this guy ruin, ruin everything that's meant to be. So what do they do? They, they originally plan on killing him, and then they decide, you know what, we don't have to kill him for this to be accomplished. Let's just sell him. So they sell him. And, and you know, it, it's wild when you see their, their reaction. You know, it's... Um, here it is. Okay. And so it, it says here what happens. They uh, they throw them they 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 throw them in the pit, right? Originally when they're when they're planning to uh, to kill him or sell him, right? So they throw him in the pit. It says then they, they they took him, cast him into the pit. The pit was empty. No water was in it. And then they sat to eat food. Like, okay, lunchtime. Right? Like, it, it's, it's like, it's a bit of a funny thing, you know. I mean, you're, you're, you're basically, you know, plotting. Okay, we're, we're, we're killing our brother. Let's go eat. You know, I, I don't care who you are. I don't care how bad a person is. They're, you know, they're... And, and, and anyone who's going to that extreme has, has uh, you know, a major psychosis, you know, a major psychological <laughs> problem. Um, and that's, and that's, that's not what's happening here. You know, and that, that's, you know, because again, this, this, was, this wasn't just a, you know, malicious fight between the brothers. This is them literally, you know, in their eyes, saving the destiny of the Jewish people. So to them it was, okay, this is something that has to be done. And that's how it is. So what happens? They sell him in the end, they take his coat, they slaughter a goat, they dip the coat in, in the blood, 
And then they, they come to their father and they say, you know, I, we think this is Yosef's coat. Is it his coat? He says, yeah. So, you know, he must have been torn apart by a wild animal. So he goes into mourning. Now, okay, he goes into mourning. The brothers understand, you know, father is not going to be so available for the next little while. He's in mourning. Okay. So a year passes. <coughs> Two years, three years, four years, five years. The years just keep passing. But Father, Father Yaakov, is still in mourning. Not only is he still in mourning, he used to be alive with this with this godly spirit, Ruach HaKodesh. You know, he used to have this, this constant connection to God. That wasn't there anymore. And now the brothers realize, uh-oh. This might have, we just made a major mistake. Because had we done the right thing, okay, he would have been in mourning for a year. He would have gotten up from mourning. He, uh, he would have, you know, his, his spirit would have been revived with, 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 uh, with Ruach HaKodesh. And that just didn't happen. And so they are very, very, very nervous. Because here they did this action for the sake of the future of the Jewish people, and now to their eyes, it looks like they might have just destroyed the future of the Jewish people. Now there are two reasons why Yaakov was plunged into, into this state of mourning. One was that, uh, and, and the, the Torah says, and this is an, you know, an incredibly powerful idea, certainly for anybody who has ever lost a close relative, that in a moment, in mourning, certainly, you know, for, for, a, for a very close relative, the feeling is, I don't know how I can go on. You know, life is not going to be the same, and, and frankly, I just, you know, I, 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 it's just, I can't go about daily life anymore. And that is the natural feeling. And what it says is, or in earlier parishes, it points out that what happens is God literally gives a special blessing to the mourner as his mourning ends to forget, but not forget. <coughs> Meaning, because the person and the end is never forgotten. And, but forget enough that you're able to go on. And without that blessing, it just isn't possible. But in this case, Yosef was still alive. So God did not give him that blessing of moving on because Yosef was still alive. So I'm not going to bless you to forget your connection to your son because he's still out there. That's, that's reason number one. Reason number two is, like we said, he's in the state of mourning, not connected to God like he usually is. And that is because, like we said, the bigger picture here, God does not want him to know that Yosef is still alive. And if he's still connected to God and just and receiving this, this stream of prophecy... He would just he would realize through this you know this 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 spiritual instinct instinct that Yosef is still alive and so therefore God has to remove his special spiritual connection from Yosef during this time period so that it's from Yaakov sorry so that Yaakov would not realize that Yosef is still alive so that's what's actually happening behind the scenes but as far as the brothers are concerned they they messed up big time <coughs> future of the Jewish people done. What's going to happen? Who knows? <coughs> so they're living with this tremendous guilt. And let's see where that takes them. So what happens? You have... So that, like we said, they're living with, with, their, with their families. And then there is a famine in the land of Egypt. <coughs> and everybody knows that there's food in Egypt. You know, they have this brilliant minister... We worked it all out. There's food in Egypt. So Yaakov tells them, listen, we have nothing here. You guys go down to Egypt, get us some food. What happens? They go down. All they plan on doing, they bring their money. They plan on buying some food, just like everybody else who's coming to Egypt and buying food. They're, they're brought before, um, they're brought before uh, the minister. Minister of, of Trade and Agriculture, right? 
and they just want to buy some food. <clears throat> and what happens? He accuses them of being spies. He, rec he recognizes them. They don't know that. He recognizes his brothers. And what, what happens? He accuses them of being spies. You guys are coming from, from the land of Canaan to Egypt. I don't believe that you're coming for food. You know, 11 of you, really? What are you all doing here? I see you're all strong, fit, foreign. You're spies. So imagine what's going through their mind. They're, they're saying, what is going on here? You know, we just want some food. And uh, now we're being accused of being spies. So what does he say to them? He says, you know, tell me more about your family. They tell him they have a father, they have two brothers, one who they don't know what happened to him. The other one is at home. And what does he do? He says, listen, you know what you're going to do? You're going to prove to me that you're not spies. And you're going to prove to me that, that you're not spies by bringing your youngest brother here. I want to see that he really exists and you're not lying to me. So they're, they're nervous about it. And, and, uh, and, and, and they're not sure what to do. Okay, what choice do they have? Everyone is starving back home. They need the food. They agree. And he says, and you know what? You know, obviously I'm concerned that you guys are not going to come back. So I'm even going to take one of your brothers and, and, and put him in jail. So he takes Shimon, he puts him in jail. He says, when, I'm going to take him as ransom. When you guys come back with your youngest brother, then I'll give him back to you. What choice do they have? <coughs> now, again, think of, what the, uh, of, of what's happening in their minds right now. They're like, what is going on here? We just wanted some food. Now, he's locking up our brother. We're being accused of spies. Now we have to bring the one brother left from, 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 uh, from Rachel, from Rachel. You know, Yaakov's not going to be pleased. What is happening? So what happens? Right from the beginning, what do they say? Right when he tells them this. Right? He says, bring your youngest brother. Then your words will be verified and you will not die. And they did so. And then they said to one another, what is their conversation? Indeed, we are guilty concerning our brother inasmuch as we saw his heartfelt anguish when he pleaded with us, and we paid no heed. That is why this anguish has come upon us. Right away, they're seeing it from, from the bigger perspective. They're saying, you know what? This is no coincidence. We messed up, and now it's coming back to us. It's coming back to get us. We're being punished for, for what we wrongfully did to our brother. Okay, what can you do? Things are looking bad. Then what happens? They go home. Now, of course, they have to tell Yaakov that Shimon is in jail over there. He tells them that, that he accuses us of being spies. And the only way that we can get him back is if we go back with Binyamin. He said, Yaakov says, absolutely not. You guys are not taking Binyamin down. And that's the end of it. How we're going to get Shimon back, we'll have to figure out. You're not taking Benjamin back. He's the last, he's the only one I have left from his mother. Okay. So they have food in the meanwhile. They're eating. And the food is less and less and less. And finally, what happens? They're out of food. And they go to they go back to their father and they say, listen, we're out of food. We have to make a decision here. So he says, Alright, what can you do? We don't we don't have food. Take take your brother. And uh, you know, may God be with you. You know, he's in the meantime. Yaakov has resigned himself to the fact that he might not might not see Binyamin again, and he basically makes it clear to them that if that happens, he will probably die in grief. But what can you do? They can't just sit there starving. So they take Binyamin and they go back. Things finally start to ease up. You know, they come with Binyamin. Yosef release, releases Shimon to their brothers again. He instructs the, his servants. That to take them to his house, his private residence, where they will eat together. And, and that's what happens. Okay. So they're eating together. And he's giving more portions and, and favoring Binyamin, which they think is a little strange. Okay. They eat. They get more food 
for, to take back home, and then they go on their way. They, they, and finally, things have calmed down, right? This whole ordeal is finally coming to an end, you know, all this craziness. They finally worked it out with the crazy minister, and they got their food, and now they're going back, and everyone's together, and thank God. No. What happens? Yosef's servant had put Yosef's special silver goblet in Binyamin's backpack. They go on their way. And then they're on the, on the journey for a little bit. And then the servant runs after them and says, what's wrong with you guys? What's wrong with you? You see how, how, how nicely my master dealt with you? And you run off with his silver goblet? How could you do that? They say, listen, you're crazy. We don't know what you're talking about. He says, listen, this is this, I'm telling you this is the case. And I'm going to, let, let's see for ourselves. So he goes through it. Goes through the backpack, one after the other, oldest to youngest. And finally, he gets to the, back, the backpack of Vinyamin. He opens it up, and there is the silver goblet. And there the brothers see, oh my gosh, Vinyamin the youngest, the ungrateful, you know, he comes with us, and what happens? He steals the goblet. Can't believe this. So he says, they say, oh, you know, we're, we're so sorry. The servant says, sorry is not enough. You know the rules here in Egypt. You steal something, you become the slave of the one you stole from. This guy is coming back to Egypt. He's going to be slave to my master. They ride off together. The brothers follow him. <coughs> Finally, Yehuda comes forward. He confronts Yosef and he says, <coughs> you know, that this can't be happening. And again, like we said, the night, the, it was a nightmare already. Finally, relief. And then the nightmare just got infinitely worse. Worst case scenario now. Binyamin's being taken. They can't go back to Yaakov without Binyamin. You know, they know. They go back to, to, to Yaakov without Binyamin. He dies. Dies in grief. Then, that, then, then that, that's the, the, the nail in the coffin of the future of the Jewish people. That can't happen. But on the other hand, Binyamin, what can you do? This, was, this is his problem. He clearly took something that wasn't his. That's how it goes. But no, like we said, they're, they're seeing the bigger picture now. Whether or not Binyamin is guilty, and it certainly seems that way, there's a bigger picture. It's not about Binyamin now. It's about, about the future, about the Jewish people. Yuda comes to Yosef, and, and, and he reveals himself, and, and, and he offers himself in his place. The ultimate act, act of sacrifice for the bigger picture, he says, there's more going on here. You know, if it's about Binyamin, I'm older, I'm stronger, I'm more experienced, take me instead. And at that point, <coughs> Yosef reveals himself. And it literally goes from the darkest possible situation ever to redemption. And that, that is, like I said, you know, the, the story of, you know, there's great detail here. And the story of the brothers is the story, is, is the story of all of us. And, this, and, and who, who hasn't been in this story? Who hasn't lived through this story where, you know, life is going a certain way? Either we make a, mistake or make a mistake or we don't. Darkness. You know, things are looking bad. You know what? It's not just like a, a one-time thing. It's a period of darkness. You know, it, it's a rough patch, a rough period of time. A week, a month, a year, whatever it is. It's not looking good. You know? Yaakov's in mourning for years. And then, then you know what happens? When you think it can't get any worse, it gets worse. They just want to buy some food. No, it becomes this whole crazy Egyptian ordeal. And within that ordeal, it just keeps getting worse and worse. They take Shimon, he wants Binyamin. Or spies. Binyamin takes the cup, now he's a slave. And there was a period in time right there where it looked like things were getting a little bit better. You know, they come back, they give Yosef the food, they show him Binyamin, they get Shimon back, they eat together. Just when things are looking like it's getting a bit better? No. Even worse. It, gets, it reaches the lowest point of darkness. And when, you, when in that lowest point of darkness, when it literally cannot get any, any worse, bam. In a flash, redemption. 
That's been our story throughout history as a, as a people, as individuals. The Purim story. Just go through it, story after story. That's the cycle. And they had, the brothers understood. Why did they have to go through all that? Because for them, it was their own personal redemption. It was them learning not to repeat the mistakes of the past, <coughs> to correct the mistakes of the past. So they made this major mistake with Yosef. Would it happen again? Here they were put in the same situation again. Here's Binyamin. Do we give up Binyamin, the evil, who seems evil at the time, ruining, just when things are looking good, he ruins everything for us? Or do we get, be, go above that, beyond that, and, and, and let that go, and, and ultimately, Yehuda, offer myself in his place for the sake of the bigger picture. And what did they do? They passed the test. They did not repeat the, the, the mistakes of the past. They, they did the best they could do in the situation. They, they came out on top. And in that moment, when Yosef revealed himself and said, I am Yosef, and the whole thing fell away, they realized that all, all of this, all this difficulty was, was necessary and in some ways even a gift because through this difficulty, it got us to a stage that we were not at before, a level that we were not at before. We became better, greater people. And while they could barely withstand the pressure of that situation, looking back, there's no question, looking back at the events that unfolded, they could look back and say, wow, Gam Zulatova. That was, all of that was really for the best. Because then we truly became the, you know, the great tribes of Israel. And it says, you know, when, when Yaakov was on his deathbed, surrounded by his sons, he was surrounded by... By, by greatness. It says every single one of his, his, his sons had achieved a, a level of greatness. And it was only through these difficulties and making the right choices, correcting the wrong, that they were able to get there. And that is, that is the major lesson, you know, that we learn from the brothers. That is the major lesson. The major lesson that we learn from the brothers is, is that greatness cannot be achieved without difficulty. <coughs> and I'm going to repeat that. Greatness of any sort cannot and will not be achieved without difficulty. And I'll say it again because it's so crucial and so annoying to hear, but so true. Greatness cannot be accomplished and achieved without difficulty. And that's, and that's our story. That's the story of our lives. Right? We've all, every single one of us, has been through very difficult moments. Might even be, might even be, more difficult moments ahead. Right? Time will tell. And and those moments are meant to to be there and and, and to build us. And there's no question, there's no question that that there's, like we said, you know, there's tremendous anguish and difficulty involved. And it's you know. Can you even get out of bed in the morning? You know, that's, that's how bad it is. And like we said, even when it starts to look a little better, then it gets even worse. But, but our approach um, has always been that the, uh, the greater the difficulty, um, you know, the harder we have to work through it, and eventually the greater we become. And there is no greater example of this. As much as the brothers are the ultimate example of this, there's no greater example of this than Yosef himself. Because with all the trouble that the brothers went through, at the very least, you know, and again, it looks like the destiny of the Jewish people is done and their and the father, at the very least, they had each other. Not Yosef. Right? What did he have? He had nothing. He was sold to a bunch of Arabs, sold to Egypt, literally the only member of his bloodline in the entire country foreign country. One thing goes bad one thing after another. And Yosef? No. What happens with Yosef? What does Yosef do? So again, like I said, you know, if it, if it was me, I just, well, you know, why bother getting out of bed in the morning? You know? At least lie there until, you're, until, until your master, like, pours cold water on your head and, and, you know, forces you to get up. No, that wasn't him. Yosef, when he was sitting in that caravan, 
being carried off from his family to Egypt had a very clear decision to make. Either collapse into complete and utter despair, which the situation certainly would call for, or recognize, internalize, and fully believe and understand that there's a bigger picture. And Yosef, in that moment, took, took the ladder, and he said, you know, as, as rotten as this situation seems, there's a bigger picture, and there's a bigger plan. And how do we know that that's the, the, that's the position that he took? Because you just look at his career through Egypt. Like I said, I'd be lying in bed. No, he wasn't lying in bed. Everywhere he was, he rose to the top. Right? He, he joins Potiphar's household. He becomes the head of the house, head servant of the house. Things go rotten again. He gets thrown in jail. He becomes a second in command to the jail warden. He's not, he's not despairing. Yeah, times are rough. And he certainly had some bad days, that I'm sure of. But on the whole, there's a bigger picture. This is all for a reason. And it is absolutely incredible, you know, and we'll finish with this point, absolutely incredible to my mind about when he reveals himself to his brothers in this week's Parsha. So what does he do? Again, he sees, he, you know, he sees the brothers have finally made the right choice. They're willing to complete and absolute self-sacrifice for Binyamin, for, his father, for their father. And he sees that they, like we said, they repented. They were not the same people that they were before. And so what does he do? Again, even in this moment, he's, he's seeing the bigger picture. He sends all of his Egyptian servants out so that his brothers won't be embarrassed in front of his servants. Now it's just him and his brothers. Nobody else. And what happens? He says to them, right, l listen to this scene. Now Yosef could not restrain himself in the presence of all who stood before him. So he called out, remove everyone from before me. Right? It's just him and his brothers. Thus no one remained with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He cried in a loud voice, Egypt heard, and Paro's household, household heard. And Yosef said to his brothers, I am Yosef. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him because they were left disconcerted before him. They were in shock. Me, crazy Egyptian minister, I'm your brother Yosef. They, they could not talk. It was such shock for them. Finally, after, after what they did to him, they're finally meeting face to face with all the parties involved. What can they say? What can they say to him? And what does he say? It's mind boggling. So first of all, he says, come close to me, if you please. He sees they're just, they're, they're shocked into places. He says, no, come closer. I don't mean you any harm. He says, I am Joseph, your brother. It is me whom you sold into Egypt. And now be not distressed, nor reproach yourselves for having sold me here. For it was to be a provider that God sent me ahead of you. For this has been, has been two of the hunger years in the midst of the land, and there are yet five years in which there shall be neither plowing nor harvest. Thus God has sent me ahead of you to ensure your survival in the land and to, to sustain you for a momentous deliverance. And now, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Paro, master of his entire household, and ruler throughout the entire land of Egypt. He says, and then he tells them, you know, go back, tell your father that I'm still alive. And, and, and that's what he does. And, and, then what, and then, this is an incredibly emotional moment. And throughout the story, there, there's two times where Yosef literally has to stop, go into a different room and cry because he can't control himself. But again, Yosef is seeing the bigger picture the whole time. He's, he's not revealing himself to his brothers right away. No, he sees there's a plan that has to come about here. And only then, after restraining himself for so long and finally revealing himself to his brothers and telling them, I have nothing against you. I've been seeing the bigger picture the whole time. As difficult as things were, it was always clear to me that there was a bigger picture. God was running things from behind the scenes. And only at this point, and then it says, then he fell upon his brother Binyamin's neck and wept. He wept with his brother. And Binyamin wept upon his neck. He then kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. Afterwards, his brothers conversed with him. 
an incredible amount of faith that, that guided Yosef throughout his entire life. As difficult and lousy as things were, and like I said, they could not be any lousier for a person alive. No. He knew. He knew things were worse. And, and, and those difficulties made him an even greater man. The man who could, who could face his brothers and say to them, I don't have anything against you. It wasn't you. It was God acting through you. And that is the ultimate lesson. And like we said, we learned from the brothers, you know, you, the, the difficulties of life, they build us. But you see even more from Yosef, who had even more difficulty than they did, he rose to an even greater level. And while his brothers are, are, are in moments of panic and saying, this is clearly God punishing us, it was, but it was more than that. It was God developing a whole story, a bigger picture. They were still stuck in the moment. They couldn't see the bigger picture. No. Yosef, who went through even harder times, rose above them and was able to see with crystal clarity throughout every difficult moment of his life to the extent that he had nothing in his heart against his brothers, could hug them, kiss them, and weep with them. And, 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 and that, that is the story here. That is why the, story, the, the Torah goes into such great detail. It is not just the story of Yosef and his brothers. It's the story of the Jewish people, of each of us, and how to, to, how, we, how to live life, how to make it through the hard times, to come out strong, to come out on top, to always recognize and always at least remember that when things are hard and, and, and we're, you're in that bad mindset and, that's, that's, and that's, that's who we are, that's part of life, but to always remember, as difficult as things are, there's a bigger plan, there's a bigger picture, and somehow things are going to be better. I can't see the, the, the ending now, don't know when I'll see the ending, but things... It, it, this is going to a, 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 a greater finish than the way things look now. That's the story of the brothers. That's the story of Yosef. That's the story of these parshas. And uh, that's, the, that, that's the, the, the fuel which keeps us going through the hard times. Thank you so much for coming.